Hello, I'm Tim Smith with the Adams County Historical Society. And uh, if you like the historical content we've been putting on our YouTube channel, please subscribe. Uh, I've been asked to talk a little bit about my pet peeves for July 2nd. Way back I did a uh, pet peeve for the July 1st fighting. And um, somebody asked about my pet peeves for July 2nd. Um, you know, I don't have as many, I guess, pet peeves for July 2nd, but definitely because I've been talking about the Battle of Gettysburg for so long and I've been a tour guide for over 30 years, I have things that people say that uh, definitely bother me. Um, one of the problems, I think, is that people don't understand how complex the second day of the battle was. I mean, you know, from the evening of the first day, troops came up and troops were put in position, and it took a while to get those troops in position on July 2nd. I would have to say one of my pet peeves is, you know, why don't the Southern Army attack sooner? As a matter of fact, after the Civil War was over, uh, one of the things that uh, Juba Early promoted uh, in Virginia was this idea that General Longstreet was ordered to attack at dawn on July 2nd, and because he delayed for one reason or another, and because it took him all this time to get in position, it allowed the Northern Army to bring up reinforcements, and that caused the Southern Army to lose the battle. And that whole concept was referred to after the war as the Sunrise Attack Order. And, you know, most people don't spend much time looking into it and buy into these arguments. And unfortunately, a lot of historians of the battle who early on wrote about the battle would include this in their narrative that the Southern Army is supposed to attack early on July 2nd. The fact is that Robert E. Lee's plan for July 2nd was just really complicated and complex, and it took all day to get your troops into position. Much too much is made out of the countermarch being a factor in the delay, and not enough attention is given to the fact that Lee's plan is just all over the place on July 2nd. Another thing about that is the misinterpretation of the plan. Uh, a lot of people suggest that the plan on July 2nd was to attack both ends of the line simultaneously. And while that may have been the plan initially, it changed to the major assault being on the southern end of the northern line on July 2nd. And Yule was ordered to uh, um, make a, um, a sort of a diversion against uh, Culp's Hill and the Union right. And if the opportunity presented itself, then to make an all-out assault on that hill, which eventually it did. Um, and this gets into something else. I don't know where this started or how this became so prevalent, but it's actually been the topic of a couple um, videos that there was an acoustic shadow on the battlefield on July 2nd. And that, you know, Longstreet attacked Little and Big Round Top in the wheat field in the peach orchard. And because of the, the acoustic shadow, I'm saying this deviously because it, it's, just, it's just ridiculous to me. Uh, Yule didn't hear the fighting had started on the end of the battlefield, so he was late in getting underway. And, of course, all these factors lead to the southern defeat, acoustic shadow. Um, Another thing that bothers me on July 2nd, usually, when I am out on the battlefield, is the defense of General Sickles. And I guess the concept would be that, sure, on July 2nd, General Sickles did not occupy the position that, you know, perhaps was assigned to him and instead chose a more forward position. And there are people that suggest that because Sickles moved his troops forward, uh, it forced General Meade to shift reinforcements into that area of the battlefield. And that Sickles then became sort of a roadblock to the Southern attack. And it Sickles slowed down the Southern advance. And, you know, obviously the Northern Army won the Battle of Gettysburg. So I guess in the minds of the people who defend Sickles, 
everything led to the Northern victory. Um, I don't think that Sickles men slowed down the Southern advance on July 2nd. I think that the 20,000 reinforcements that General Meade shifted into Sickles line are the ones that slowed down the Southern advance. And uh, claiming that Sickles forward movement uh, won the battle, it's kind of like Sickles is in a fist fight and he breaks the other guy's hand with his face. So it's just a little too much for me. And anyone who is stood on a round top and looks at the situation can understand that Sickles' forward movement was a mistake. And it was against orders, no matter what these people say. Um, the, other, you know, the other thing that I find interesting about the second day um, is the Antietam-Gettysburg argument that you hear people make. So um, Antietam uh, goes down in American history as the bloodiest single day of military com uh, combat. So Antietam has about 23,000 casualties. Uh, now, what you might not know is I tend to think some of the casualties account are from the day before and a couple days after and the Battle of Antietam started early in the morning prior to dawn, and it went on until dark. So the fighting lasted all day. We had 50,000 casualties at Gettysburg, and 20,000 of them are on the second day of the battle, after 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So, you know, in a condensed period of time, the second day of Gettysburg has to be considered as one of the bloodiest affairs in American history. Um, now, also, you know, it's hard to not to talk about this topic without discussing the overemphasis that's been placed on Little Round Top as part of the Second Day's Battle. And of course, since the novel The Killer Angels and the movie Gettysburg has come out, the overemphasis of the 20th Maine Infantry as part of the fighting on the Second Day. There are plenty of regiments at Gettysburg, and each regiment played a role in the battle. One of my favorite discussions at this point is by Harry Fonts in his book, July 2nd, or the second day that he wrote. And in it, he talks about different points in the second day's battle where things could have turned if you know, a unit did not make a charge like the 1st Minnesota or uh, Willard's Brigade. And he mentions in it, that um, the second day was a day that required a lot of saving, that there were places where this unit or that unit saved the day. Um, and, you know, uh, it's really difficult when you're giving a battlefield tour and someone who's watched the movie 30 or 40 times comes on your tour and all they want to do is talk about the 20th Maine and their role in the battle. So what we normally try to do is to highlight other aspects of the second day's fighting uh, to you know, talk about the overall outcome of the battle. And then the fact that the fighting on Little Round Top is not even that heavy as compared to the fighting that took place at Devil's Den, the wheat field, or the peach orchard out in front of it. Uh, you might read my good friend Gary Edelman's book, The Myth of Little Round Top, that he's very proud of. And then on that vein, one of the other things that happened on July 2nd that really led to the Northern victory and is an unappreciated aspect of the battle is the Sixth Corps march. So the Sixth Army Corps was in Manchester, Maryland on the evening of July 1st when they got word that the battle uh, was occurring at Gettysburg. And so they left Manchester and marched to Westminster and then to Gettysburg. And depending on which account you choose to believe, it's something like 32 miles and 17 hours that they marched through the night into the next day. And when they reached Rock Creek, it allowed General Meade to release the 5th Army Corps from reserve, and they were sent over to Little Round Top and played a critical role in the fighting there. So one could argue that it was the marching of these men that helped lead to the Northern victory. And, um, you know, uh, the whole idea 
on July 2nd of General Longstreet's disobedience bothers me. I understand that some people uh, don't appreciate Longstreet's role in the battle. And I understand that Longstreet is critical of Robert E. Lee in his post-war writings, and a lot of people are big fans of Robert E. Lee. Um, and so some of my friends who are, you know, military historians and battlefield guides um, tend to believe that Longstreet's writings after the Civil War are inaccurate or um, that he's... Um, espousing views to the general public in his writings that he did not express to Robert E. Lee at that time. But the idea that Longstreet is not in favor of the assaults on July 2nd and July 3rd and therefore wants to, them to fail or does things to make sure they fail or delays the attack or um, according to Edward Stackpole, by his childish activities, is just preposterous. Um, the Southern Army was trying to win the battle on July 2nd, but the Northern Army just had a better position and more men at the point of attack and was able to drive them back. 